Welcome to State Line Seventh Day Adventist Church. I'm glad each one of you are here today. Um, I'd like to welcome our 3ABN viewer, viewing audience and those that are watching live stream or however uh, YouTube that you're watching this. May the Lord bless you as you worship with us. Um, our message today is brought to us by Pastor John Stafford and it's part two of uh, facing the future fearlessly. I look forward to hearing the rest of the story. It's a privilege to be back here with you. I just, I feel really at home in this church. It's just wonderful. Especially when we don't have to wear the masks. And that's great. <laughs> I hope you all got the uh, handout. Uh, I, you can catch up with the part one with your handout. And you can uh, see that uh, on the first page. On the second page, you will also have Facing the Future Fearlessly, part two. And so uh, get your pens out and pencils and fill in the blanks. Uh, that way, um, I'm more of your teacher than a preacher. Is that okay? Yeah. I'd like to begin by uh, showing a story that uh, took place in Miami, Florida. <clears throat> it's a story of Dell and Pat Hicks, who were saved from Hurricane Andrew. They were both familiar with storms and hurricanes and knew it was important to be prepared. I'm going to move uh, quickly through these first few slides because this is a review from last week, so I'm going to just show these quickly to you. These pictures, these cars uh, were made available to you. How many of you know Psalm 31 says here last night? Did you work on it? I see a few hands. I heard you just review this uh, promise that every day. <clears throat> you know, you know, 
circus. But he showed us this is the flower and prepare us a pestilence. He'll cover you with his feet and under his feet shall that take you to the truth of be your shield and fire. The terror night of the earth that they nor the paths that walk in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand is your hand, but it shall not come near you. Only I shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you say, Lord, who is my your most place, no shall you shall all you shall play your dwelling. For he shall be a charge over you to keep you in your ways. They shall bear you up, lest for a fear of that. In other words, you might dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, for the dragon you shall trample on my foot. Because he had set his love upon me, for I will over him, I set him up because he had given my name. Call him, and I will answer. I will deal with the trouble of whatever is on him. And with my own life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. <clears throat> uh, this is Bill and Pat Hicks during Hurricane Andrew that applied the promise of Psalm 91. They were both in the storm hurricanes, and it was important to treat I don't know how I've seen something like this or you have ever in a hurricane. But uh, we've been in some pretty storms in the trucks. And we even have people here. They come to their door and the windows are plastic. And the food were stored in their homes in the direct path of a 150 mile per hour storm. Uh, as it was important. Roads full of cars, bumper to bumper, traveling at five miles per hour. And looking at their palm trees bent over by the wind, Pat knew that she had authority in the name of Jesus over anything. Uh, someone took a picture of Hurricane Andrew, and we, it's amazing how it looks like the devil himself was up there in the clouds. Uh, it was very devastating for the people that suffered destruction, total destruction, as if a bomb had gone through the area. Pat remembered how the Israelites applied the blood on their doorposts, so she applied the blood of Jesus over her house, quoting Psalm 91. And so she declared, We dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We say in the heavenlies that you are our God, and our refuge in this storm. Pat walked through the yard laying hands on the trees, confessing that they were now under the shadow of the Almighty, and then touching the house, the utilities shed, and placing everything under the protection of the God of the universe. By 2 p.m., actually 2 a.m., the electricity was cut. As the storm strengthened, they could hear things crashing into the house. By 4 a.m., it seemed the house was about to break in two. It sounded like a jet taking off the runway or like a freight train running right through the house. When the walls were shaking, they laid their hands on them, commanding them to stand strong in the name of Jesus. The roof convulsed, but it held together. It was proof that the name of Jesus was greater and had more power than any hurricane. Amen. It wasn't until 7 a.m. that the storm subsided. They stepped outside and it looked like pictures from a movie of a city that had been bombed. They were amazed that their home was the only one standing. <clears throat> their maple tree was still standing. Pat said that their house looked like an oasis and soon became like a tourist attraction. One neighbor asked, what on earth did they do? And he was suspicious, saying, you've been praying again, haven't you? <laughs> <clears throat> 
For the next weeks, family members and friends whose homes were destroyed came to live with the Hicks. As they drove through the 40-mile line of destruction, all they could say was the devastation was beyond description, and it broke their hearts to see how many people had lost property and possessions at the hand of the enemy. The storm was a Category 5. 65 people died and more than 250,000 were left homeless. 82,000 businesses were destroyed. Dell and Pat thank God for the name of Jesus. They are more determined than ever to begin each day reciting Psalm 91. They said that Psalm 91 is and always will be our refuge in every storm. Amen. You know, as, as I've been uh, teaching Psalm 91, I've decided to begin, before I even get out of bed, reciting it over and over in my mind. And you know, I, for this old brain of mine, that's what I have to do. And so I would encourage you to uh, memorize this wonderful chapter. The next verse <clears throat> is, uh, actually, I think one of these homes that belonged to the Hickses. Uh, some were, had major damage. Am I going backwards? I'm going backwards. Okay. And so the question is, where will you be in that day? Uh, only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. And so we will only, as we saw in our Sabbath school lesson today, that we will only see the reward of the wicked. And so when you think about that, the worst thought that I can possibly come into my mind would be to imagine myself on the outside of the walls. Of, and... Uh, looking in. And uh, so I have a burden on my heart, not only for myself, but for all of you, that we be on the inside, Very looking good. out. <clears throat> uh, it will be a sad thing to look at. We probably won't want to watch it very long. So who will survive the final destruction? In Patriarchs and Prophets, I read, when God destroys the wicked from off the earth, but the righteous will be preserved in the midst of these commotions. As Noah was preserved in the ark, God will be uh, their refuge, and under his wings shall they trust. Amen. So we have a wonderful God who will be our refuge and should already be our refuge every day in the storms of life. And so in verse 9, the next verse, we read how will, uh, we read a condition. Our part of uh, this promise is uh, the condition. These promises are conditional. Because, that's an interesting word, because as long as you have made the Lord, which is your refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, and then comes God's part. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Shouldn't that be a promise we should claim, especially during these days? And so, <clears throat> how do you make Jesus your dwelling place? Have you made Jesus your dwelling place? You think of making your home a dwelling place for yourself and for Jesus, but Jesus actually becomes your dwelling place. And how do you do that? How have you done it in your home? Well, I would suggest the thing that would be very important to do is to have family daily worship. Amen. And then to sing praises together, reading his word and praying together. My wife and I have started a habit at the beginning of breakfast to sing through singing youth. And uh, you probably have a copy of that songbook in your house. But it's a blessing to sing together and pray together. The family who prays together stays together. Amen? And so <clears throat> we have the next promise here about angels. Uh, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. 
Isn't that comforting to know that the angels, your angel is in charge of you? and that uh, he is there to comfort you and to protect you. Uh, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, in the ways that God wants you to go. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest for, or for fear that you dash your foot against a stone. Have angels ever protected you in your travels? While we were traveling in Africa, we would get in the habit of placing our hand up against the windshield when big trucks and big buses would drive by on a gravel road. And, uh, and so we were driving along, and I just had my hand up there against the windshield, and all of a sudden, I felt my hand just break through the windshield, and there was a big bang. That truck had thrown a rock right at our windshield. And uh, it could have damaged us. We could have been hurt, but we, we were not hurt at all. And uh, we were able to go back to the VW shop in Mwanza, Tanzania. At noon, normally it's closed, but they were open. And within a half hour, they had a brand new windshield put in our car. Wow, you know, so uh, God has taken care of it. That's just one of many miracles that took place on that trip that God provided for us. And we even broke a, a transmission block. Uh, another stone came in and hit our, underneath our car. And uh, God found another transmission block uh, in, in uh, Mwanza, there in Tanzania. It's a, it's a long story, but God takes care of us Amen. in our travels. <clears throat> Uh, the angel of the Lord surrounds those who fear him. So there are other scriptures that enhance our study today. Psalms uh, 34, verse 7. Let's read it together. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Amen. And so the angel of the Lord camps around us. And so uh, are, are these divine beings, these uh, an angelic beings, do they make the Lord omnipresent? And so we are just dwelling in the presence of God. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord is a wall of fire surrounding Jerusalem. This is another encouraging word. In Zechariah 2.5, God says, For I will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Uh, what a great promise that is. Amen. You know, I, when I think about a wall of fire, angels appearing as in fiery chariots. You remember the story about Elisha as, uh, and his servant as they were being surrounded by the Syrian army? And the servant was getting really worried. Uh, the story is found in 2 Kings 6, 15, 16. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us uh, are more than those. Uh, more, so do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Amen. You know, if our eyes were open today, what would we see in this, in this church? We would be filled with angels. Amen. And so we need to practice the presence of the Lord and of his angels every day. Have you heard about John Patton? Uh, he was a missionary to the cannibals in the New Hebrides Islands. And he tells a story, he tells the following story. I'd like to just read it with you, read it to you. He says, uh, this is uh, told by uh, Pastor John MacArthur. He tells a story about the same angelic care that he received in his lifetime. He said that one night, wild natives surrounded his house, frantically dancing and jumping up and down in the jungle, desiring to kill John and his wife and so they could eat them. 
Well, they got on their knees, realizing there was no way they could protect themselves against these wild cannibals, and they prayed. Soon after that, the attackers all vanished into the jungle. They were gone. According to Patton's biographer, a year later, the chief of the tribe became a Christian. And John asked him at that time, what happened that night about a year ago when your natives surrounded our little lean-to there on the sand near the beach? And all of a sudden, they left. They just disappeared. And this is what the chief said. Well, because of all those men you had with you, we left. John said, well, there was no men, just myself and my wife. The chief said that they had seen men standing guard, hundreds of big men in shining clothes with swords in their hands, uh, totally circling his home. Did God dispatch a legion of angels to protect his servant? Amen. Well, it wouldn't be the first time. And so God is an awesome God. Uh, there's another story. You may not have heard this one about the white cavalry, cavalry in Europe. Have you heard about it? In uh, the white cavalry at Bethune, France, in April 1918, Gwen Day records in his book, The Wonder of Word, Moody Press. He says, the story of white cavalry at Bethune is attested by thousands of Germans and related in the words of a Prussian officer. It goes like this, and I quote, we were advancing at the head of our troops, all of whom were in excellent spirits, singing as they swung along, thinking that the British were now defeated, and all that remained was to go forward without opposition and capture Paris. By my side was Lieutenant Fritz, and he suddenly seized hold of my arm, saying, Look, Herr Kapitän, there is a large body of mounted men approaching Bethune on the other side, and they are all clad in white and are mounted on white horses, who can they be? I don't know, I replied. They may be British Colonel Mounted Troops. Well, we halted instinctively and stood watching those white, uniform-clad cavalry advancing quietly through the smoke, their figures clearly outlined in the shining sun. We saw the shells breaking into death-dealing fragments and bursting amidst their ranks with shattering crashes. And so the cavalry advanced slowly and methodically and nothing could stop them. And uh, so they believed that God answered the prayers of the British people and delivered England. And he answered, had he answered prayer of sending his invisible army and given those people at least a glimpse of his host, it's very possible. Yeah. There's an invisible army that is ready to uh, deliver us from, uh, from evil. It was angels that, that caused the the walls of Jericho to fall. And uh, I'm going to move forward here. We could read about that. Uh, angel reinforcements are promised to us. I saw evil angels contending for souls and angels of God resisting them. The conflict was severe. Evil angels were corrupting the atmosphere with their poisonous influence and crowding about their, these souls to stupefy their sensibilities. Holy angels were anxiously watching and waiting to drive back Satan's host. But it is not the work of good angels to control the minds of men against their will. If they yield to the enemy and make no effort to resist him, then the angels of God can do but little more than hold in check the host of Satan. That they shall not destroy until further light be given to those in peril, to move them to arouse and look to heaven for help. Jesus will not commission holy angels to extricate those who make no effort to help themselves. If Satan sees that he is in danger of losing one soul, he will exert himself to the utmost to keep that one. And when the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and fervor looks to Jesus for strength, Satan fears that he will lose a captive and he calls a reinforcement of his angels to hedge in the poor soul and form a wall of darkness around him that heaven's light may not reach him. But if the one in danger perseveres and in his helplessness casts himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, our Savior listens to the earnest prayer of faith. And what does he say? Reinforcements. Reinforcements of those angels that excel in strength to deliver him. Hallelujah. What uh, awesome God we have to provide for our protection. And then verse 13, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. 
You know, uh, Satan uh, was told by Jesus, the serpent, uh, ser Jesus told the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And then we have <clears throat> this promise in Psalms 108. Through God we will do valiant, valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. So God is the one who does the treading. And God, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And then in Revelation, we find out who that serpent is, and I think we know who that is. It's a, God says that the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, <clears throat> This verse tells us that we can uh, uh, tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon. We can also trample under feet. And so uh, these are different things that, that could become our lions and our, our uh, uh, problems that we face every day. Uh, I'm going to just run through these really quickly. What lions are there in your life? Do you have negative thinking? Uh, my wife or husband doesn't love me. Has that thought ever crossed your mind? Or lustful thinking, doubt, anger? And so <clears throat> we read in Revelation 12, 17 that the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Yes, God has so many wonderful promises uh, that he is sharing with us, he's giving to us in these last few verses. Uh, you know the promises of, or the prayers of faith, uh, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. And in 1 John 5, 14, his is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. And so we can uh, claim these promises uh, that God will deliver us. He says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. And uh, uh, I'm going to move on to the next promise. I will set him on high because he has known my name. And then the third promise, uh, I'm moving forward here because I'm running out of time. Uh, you shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Amen. What an awesome God we have. And then finally, uh, <clears throat> He says, I will answer him if we call on him. Before they call, I will answer. <clears throat> I will be with him in trouble. Uh, that's promise number four. And we could uh, look at how many times he promised us to deliver us when we are in trouble. To deliver us when we cry out to him and when we have afflictions. And so how will God honor his people? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. What a wonderful promise we have of the crown of life. Amen. And that we will sit with him on his throne. What an honor that will be. And that we are going to be priests of God and of Christ, and we will reign with him a thousand years. What an honor that is that uh, he has promised for us. And then finally, with long life, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Are you satisfied with your life? Uh, are you experiencing the abundant life? Amen. Well, Jesus said, uh, I have come that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. And so I would like to encourage you to give your heart to Jesus and uh, let him be the Lord of your life. And uh, these promises, uh, you can review with their handout and uh, make them part of your very life. May they be your bread of life. Amen. So I'd just like to close with a prayer. 
uh, <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we thank you for these promises. We thank you that you are there for us and that you have not left us to, to fight these battles alone, but that you have commissioned your holy angels to come to our help, come to our protection and our rescue. Lord, keep our eyes on you and not on the problems and the difficulties and the, and the faults of others and of ourselves, that we may rejoice in your presence and be ready for your very soon return. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand with me so we